Hey, welcome to Monster Monday. Today, we're gonna be handling a big one. It's the Abeleth. Stay tuned. All right, the Abeleth has been one that a lot of you guys have requested. Um, and in various like Twitter threads, I've seen people ask DMs if they've used the Abeleth and how they've used it. So we're gonna work our way through um, the Abeleth and really what, what a DM could do with this and why a DM would use this creature um, or how it could be used in several different kinds of encounters. So let's take a look, uh, if you're following along at home, this is on the Monster Manual, page 13. So the Abeleth is a large aberration. It's lawful evil. Now, right off the bat, that, that information implies something. It's lawful evil. Um, the Abeleth is not just some big, massive leviathan with no intelligence just swarming and destroying and devouring wherever it goes. It's actually very intelligent. So if we look at its actual stats, of course it has a beastly 21 strength because it's a, a large creature. Um, it's slow, it's got a low dex, uh, it's got an average con of 15, but its intelligence and charisma scores are massive. They're 18 intelligence, 18 charisma. So even though the Abeleth like, like looks, and it is an aberration, and it looks like a giant monstrous thing that you think might be like mindlessly roaming around destroying things, it's actually very sentient. And as we delve into its powers um, and its actions and uh, abilities, you'll see a little more information about that. Um, first of all, let's take a look at the fact that um, it can breathe both air and water. So, you know, if you have a setting where uh, you're, you're maybe on a continent near the ocean or you're on an island setting or something like that, or maybe even you have like a saltwater um, river that moves through your continent. Maybe there's a way to integrate that in using the Abeleth. Maybe there's like a deep basin. Um, and it doesn't necessarily specify that it has to be um, saltwater. So you could have a setting with like a huge um, freshwater lake where you use an Abeleth. But Let's think about why an Abeleth would be wherever it's gonna be first. What, what is it trying to do? Um, and, and the thing about the Abeleth is that it has a lot of abilities that involve messing with people um, mentally. So the ability to enslave um, and the ability to psychically drain are two huge abilities. So not only is this a massive physical creature with uh, various attack forms that are quite deadly. But again, remember that it has a huge intelligence and charisma. So this is where I start to think of like similar creatures. So a devil, for example, a hag, intelligent creatures who manipulate their environment to get what they want and manipulate others. That could be a way to look at the Abeleth that maybe breaks you out of the mold of like just, hmm, here's a big water creature to throw at my party, right? Think more creatively, think more intelligently. Um, now, the 18 charisma it isn't necessarily linked um, in a way that most people would commonly think about charisma being linked. Uh, in this case, the 18 charisma is more in a sense of its ability to uh, completely intimidate you know, be intimidating uh, more so than I think, um, you know, how a devil or a hag would use charisma to deceive. Uh, I think the Abeleth's charisma is more coming from a perspective of charisma operating in terms of intimidation. So let's, let's switch back. So just basic physical features, uh, it's slow. It's got a swim uh, speed of 10. Sorry, it's got a land speed of 10 and a swim speed of 40. Uh, it is amphibious. It can generate a mucus cloud. So while it moves through the water, it's surrounded by a, like a, this mucus. Anyone that attempts to touch or hit it with a melee attack while within five feet of it must make a DC 14 con save. On a failure, the creature is diseased for 1d4 hours. 
the diseased creature can breathe only underwater. That is an interesting and transformative kind of thing. So as a DM, and I'm, I'm spinning the wheels and sharing my ideas with you here, let's say that the environment where you have this adventure setting um, has had some mysterious things happening. Okay, so this is where you're, you're planting the seeds. You're kind of sneakily introducing the Aboleth. You don't want to just pop it in there, right? So I'm thinking that maybe some um, local fishermen have had um, some strange observations recently where like larger fish have just shown up dead, just floating. And, um, and maybe even a few creatures, you know? So if you use like merfolk in your campaign, maybe there are a few merfolk who have just shown up like floating um, and they were diseased or something um, and, and somehow died. Or maybe some fishermen themselves had a misfortunate uh, encounter with an aboleth's mucus and were diseased and then died. So you could have kind of these rumors, you know, milling about, about um, creatures, people showing up dead. Uh, I think from the actual encounter perspective, if your players don't know that this is an aboleth, because you're not going to, you, as a DM, I never just say like, all right, you see an orc. I describe what they see. If they know what that creature is, if they've encountered it before. And why, when I say they, I mean the characters, not the players. Because you might have experienced players in your game who've read the monster manual from front to back and they know everything. So the easiest way around that is just don't name the creature when you have the encounter. Describe it. Maybe they don't see the whole thing. It's underwater. You know, maybe they just see parts of it. Maybe they're going to think it's a, you know, a giant octopus or some other creature. They don't know what it is because you haven't named it. Um, but you describe it so that they are approaching it cautiously. You describe the impact of it. Maybe, maybe the characters try to, like, Harpoon it. Maybe one of its tentacles reaches up and pulls them underwater and they try to attack back and now they're going to have to deal with the mucus thing. Um, and that's just its one of its first basic features. Uh, another maybe more important feature that lends itself back to the sentience of the Aboleth is probing telepathy. Uh, so that is, if a creature communicates telepathically with the Aboleth, the Aboleth learns the creature's greatest desires, if the Aboleth can see the creature. Now, I, I don't think telepathic encounters are necessarily that rare at a higher level for characters. And the Aboleth is a challenge rating 10. So you might have some spellcasters who have uh, telepathic powers. Maybe you have a warlock who has telepathic powers, whatever it is. Um, should they try to probe the Aboleth, the Aboleth will then kind of probe them back as long as it can see them. Now, you might be thinking, like, why would anybody try to telepathically probe an Aboleth? That's where the storytelling part comes in. Okay, so let's rewind. Why is the Aboleth there? What can it do? It can enslave people to do things for it. Um... And maybe it has like this little cult of people who are serving it for whatever reason. You can come up with that later. But maybe the Aboleth knows something. Maybe it knows something that is hidden away from the party that the party's looking for. Maybe the Aboleth has captured or enslaved someone of importance and the party is on a rescue mission. They can't find that person by just killing the Aboleth. They have to find out where the missing person is being stored. Maybe it's some subterranean airlock. Like under the water, there's a cave that opens up into an airlock space where the captured person is. Or maybe the captured person has been diseased by the Aboleth's mucus cloud, and every three hours, the Aboleth returns and exposes the person to the mucus cloud and therefore continues the disease, which has a side result of making the diseased creature only be able to breathe underwater. So maybe it's keeping these diseased minions underwater, and the party hasn't been able to find this secret underwater cave, okay? So in other words, create a reason why the Aboleth is there in your storyline. And then you can also figure out reasons of, of why the party would 
would need to investigate it more so than just like kill it. Because any DM can create, you know, adventures where you throw some monsters at the party, they kill it, they loot it, move on to the next one. If you play D&D that way, things are going to get boring after a while. Trust me, I know, because I've been playing for over 40 years. So you got to create some substance to your story. Why is the Abeleth there? What is it doing? What does it know? Who does it have? Or what does it have? Maybe it, it hasn't Maybe it's not a rescue party looking for someone who's been kidnapped by the Aboleth. Maybe there's a special magical thing that the Aboleth is guarding in its lair, and it doesn't want anybody to know about it. And they can't get to the lair. They don't know where it's hidden, and that's why they have to somehow investigate the Aboleth. And maybe that's why they try telepathically communicating with it. So those are some options. This is why on Monster Monday we go beyond just like, here's a monster. We talk about how to integrate it. Okay. Um, let's look at the actions. Uh, so it, it has multi-attack. It makes three tentacle attacks. Uh, the tentacle attacks are melee weapon attacks, plus nine to hit with a reach of 10 feet, one target. Um, it's bludgeoning damage. If the target is a creature, it must succeed on a DC 14 con save or become diseased. The disease has no effect for one minute and can be removed by any magic that cures disease. After one minute, the diseased creature's skin becomes translucent and slimy. The creature can't regain hit points unless it's underwater, and the disease can be removed only by heal or another disease-curing spell of sixth level or higher. Um, that's pretty crazy. That's So know that if you're throwing the Aboleth it has some relatively permanent effects, unless you have a really strong healer on hand. Um, and then furthermore, when the creature's outside a body of water, it takes six acid damage every 10 minutes unless moisture is applied to the skin before 10 minutes have passed. So that's a very strong effect from a melee attack. Um, and let's assume that if your party's going to into that, um, maybe they haven't investigated or researched the Aboleth. They don't know what they're running up against. So you attack them with this, and now they've got a real problem that they're going to have to solve on top of just kill this thing, right? Uh, it has a tail attack. And then the powerful attack is called Enslave, and they could do this three times a day. The Aboleth targets one creature it can see within 30 feet. The target must succeed in a DC 14 wisdom save or be magically charmed by the Aboleth until the Aboleth dies or until it's on a different plane of existence from the target. The charmed target is under the Aboleth's control and can't take reactions, and the Aboleth and the target can communicate telepathically with each other over any distance. Over any distance. Uh, let's talk about the level of that charm effect. First of all, you can't just dispel it. It's in effect until the Aboleth dies or until it's on another plane of existence. That's a very permanent charming effect. And now the Aboleth has this willing slave, not willing, this unwilling slave who's been charmed, who it can give commands to over any distance. So it could send one of its minions, one of its slaves, to do things that it can't do or that it doesn't want to do and communicate with it over any distance. And remember, this is an 18 intelligence creature. So again, let's rewind the clock for a second. The Aboleth is not just some dumb monster that is out to just chaotically destroy things. The Aboleth could literally be like the big bad end guy of your campaign. The Aboleth could have enslaved two or three people in high ranking nobility positions and be manipulating like uh, an entire kingdom. Really, truly, like what's to stop it? So um, there's another component there where you have tons of storyline potential. Maybe even the Aboleth was able to enslave a target who is a member of the party. 
maybe in the early planting seeds of this mysterious, you know, fishermen have been abducted and creatures in the lake have been just floating up to the surface dead and, you know, this, you know, so-and-so noble's daughter was swimming with her friends in the lake and she disappeared and no one's found her body and et cetera, right? The party goes to investigate, they go to the shore, maybe they even charter a boat and they go out into the lake and they're looking around and the Aboleth, 30 feet underwater, sees them. Maybe there's a brief encounter, maybe the Aboleth smashes at the ship or tries to destroy them, they fight it off and then it flees back under the water. But in that brief encounter, it used its enslave ability against one member of the party. So what you as a DM do, this, this is kind of cool, um, you write up a little letter, okay? You have everybody in the, in the party make a roll. They don't know that they're making the saving throw versus enslave, but you have their stats, their wisdom saving throws all mapped out already. You have them make the roll. You have everybody in the party make the roll. And then you give a series of letters to everybody. So each player in the party gets a letter, exactly the same letter, except for one of them. Or maybe two or three, right? So you have a bunch of letters printed out, and the letters just describe maybe a weird feeling that they have, right? But it's nothing significant. But whoever was affected by the enslave charm, maybe you have a different letter that says, you have been enslaved, role play your character as you normally would, but I will give you instructions when you need to do something differently. So they don't just act like a zombie, they act like they normally would. But this way it's between you and the player or players who have been enslaved. And it creates a little fun dynamic of paranoia at the table because no one knows who's okay and who's not okay, okay? And I'm gonna be honest, I came up with this a little bit from um, Stranger Things, and I don't want to do spoilers, but let's just say that in certain parts of Stranger Things, there are times when characters are themselves, and there are times when those characters are kind of possessed by another sentient creature. Um, so I think it could be a lot of fun at the table if the players don't know which one of them are the enslaved ones, and they just act like they normally would. But then you periodically have like instructions for how they should act or things that they need to do. Maybe it's during downtime, maybe it's during an adventure. Maybe the party's getting too close to the lair of the Aboleth and the Aboleth knows this because it's in communication with the one that failed the save. And so the Aboleth gives it instructions about which way to go and they actually go away from the true lair. And that, that can be covered with just some good DMing skills. You know, you have the person who's enslaved, hey, um, Chuck, make a roll, make a survival roll. And he rolls. It's like, okay, now the roll doesn't matter. That's just a cover. Okay, Chuck, you feel like the lair of this creature must be to the west. You just have this, this instinct based on all the observations you've made. The players at the table saw Chuck roll. And they saw Chuck succeed at that roll. Now, if Chuck rolled poorly, if he rolled a three, then you just say, yeah, you don't really, you don't really know which way to go. But then, you know, if Chuck rolls well, you say, yeah, you have this feeling that it's to the west. So that's the Aboleth misguiding Chuck, his minion, to take the party away from his lair. So there are little clever kind of DM tricks that you could do there so that the party still doesn't know which one of their members is under mind control. Um, let's look at the rest of this description, though. Whenever the charmed target takes damage, the target can repeat the saving throw. On a success, the effect ends. No more than once every 24 hours, the target can also repeat the saving throw when it's at least one mile away from the Aboleth. So I guess it's not a totally permanent charm effect, but it's still pretty strong, even with the potential for taking damage. And remember, as a DM, you don't want to let on to the party that this is an Aboleth. Don't name it. Don't let them know. You can describe it. You can refer to it as a creature. Even when you, you know, when they actually encounter it in your description, if they guess out loud at the table, they're like, I think it's an Aboleth. Or if they're like, can I make an arcana roll to see if I know what this creature is? Or can I make a nature roll? Yeah, sure, go ahead. 
And, and if they make a role, a successful role, you could say, well, it does match the description of what you have learned in your readings about the creature known as the Abeleth, but still don't confirm it. Keep it in character. It will keep your narrative more engaging and more mysterious as well. All right, now, just when you thought it was safe to start playing with the Abeleth, we get to the very end, which are the legendary actions. The Abeleth can take three legendary actions, choosing from the options below. Only one legendary action option can be used at a time and only at the end of another creature's turn. The Abeleth regains spent legendary actions at the start of its turn. Wow. Okay, the first one is Detect. The Abeleth makes a Wisdom Perception check. The next one is Tail Swipe. The Abeleth makes one tail attack. The third one is Psychic Drain. Costs two actions. One creature charmed by the Abeleth takes 3d6 psychic damage, and the Abeleth regains hit points equal to the damage the creature takes. That's crazy. So in, in that, wow. Let's think about that for a second. So in a combat round, it can use legendary actions at the end of another creature's turn, almost like, like a reaction. And within that one round, it has three. The psychic drain costs two. So on, on the start of its turn, it regains the legendary actions that it spent. So that basically means that it could tail swipe as a reaction to a creature. Wow. On top of its multi-attack, on, on top of the three tentacle attacks. Or it could do psychic drain, drain someone else psychically and regain hit points. That's super powerful. That's really powerful. So let's set this up again. The Abeleth is not a dumb, dumb creature. It's a smart, smart creature. It's manipulative by its, by its ability to enslave, to communicate telepathically, to psychically drain, to probe its enemies. That's, those are all huge things, not to mention it's a physical foe to be reckoned with, um, with a massive strength and lots of attacks and legendary actions. And this could be maybe not your whole campaign's big bad end guy, but like this could be a big part. This could be the conclusionary kind of villain for a specific adventure within a campaign that could run, you know, easily one session of multiple hours, if not multiple sessions, depending on how you set this up. You know, if you, at the, at the party's arrival to the region, if you establish these odd things that have been happening and this tumultuous political climate where these nobles are vying for power against each other and then rumors of strange behaviors from Lord so-and-so, you know, and then maybe an abducted noble person and all of this is rooted in the Abeleth, like manipulating what's going on around it. So why though? Why would this big old creature want to manipulate things that are going on around it? Maybe to preserve uh, its power, its wealth. Maybe it has amassed a trove of treasure in its lair. Maybe, um, maybe it's threatened. Maybe it, the, the lake that it lives in is actually has been, you know, the population around it has been growing. There's too many ships, too many people around, and there's industry and, you know, there's sewage draining into the lake, whatever. Maybe environmentally speaking, it doesn't like how things are going on in the big world above, and that's why it started kind of uh, its own campaign to rid its immediate area of people who are harmful to it. Um, so, a lot of potential there for that big, bad, nasty guy. 
And I hope you learned some interesting ways to use this. Again, very flexible. This could be a creature who lives off the coast of an island in salt water. It could be a creature who makes its home in a specific large deep river uh, and causes problems for the different towns built along the river. It could be a creature who makes its home near a lake or, I mean, I guess technically in a swamp, if there was a deep part of a swamp um, or a river that emptied into a swamp and it kind of lives and dwells around that. So a lot of different ways in which you can use the aboleth. And, and frankly, here's one that just popped into my head. I guess technically the aboleth could be a creature in the great white north of your plane. Uh, maybe there's a massive uh, underwater uh, lake that's frozen over year round. You know, and I'm, I'm drawing from like the R.A. R. Salvatore, uh, like 10 towns and, you know, uh, the northern part of the Forgotten Realms. You know, maybe you have this like Alaska type environment where, you know, 10 months out of the year, the lake is frozen over and then a couple months out of the year, it's, it's not, but it's a super deep lake. And at the bottom of this lake is this Aboleth. So maybe, you know, it's, its environment is uh, cold water, you know? All right, now on page 14, we have a whole bunch of additional information that'll help us flesh out how to use the Aboleth. Um, and that's one of the things that I like about fifth edition Monster Manual and like Volo's Guide and Morden Canaan's Tome is that they delve a little bit deeper than just a stat block with a lot of these creatures. So, Aboleth. Before the coming of the gods, Aboleths lurked in primordial oceans and underground lakes. They reached out with their minds and seized control of the burgeoning life forms of the mortal realm, making those creatures their slaves. Their dominance made them like gods. Then the true gods appeared, smashing the Aboleths' empire and freeing their slaves. Aboleths have never forgotten. Eternal memories. Aboleths have flawless memories. They pass on their knowledge and experience from generation to generation. Thus, the injury of their defeat by the gods remains perfectly preserved in their minds. Aboleths' minds are treasure troves of ancient lore, recalling moments from prehistory with perfect clarity. They plot patiently and intricately across eons. Few creatures can conceive of the extent of the Aboleths plan. So this harkens back in many ways, guys, to what I was saying about the Aboleth being intelligent. And when we asked ourselves, why would the party want to telepathically probe an Aboleth? Well, maybe they're seeking ancient and forbidden knowledge. Maybe in your campaign, you have established these little clues about prehistory and the importance of the gods. And you've now shown your party that there's like this whole storyline and thread that they could pursue. And they want to know more about the Aboleths and the Primordials and this struggle between the divine pantheon of gods in your world. Uh, and I could see this easily being integrated into a Forgotten Realms campaign because that so much of that early, you know, prehistorical Forgotten Realms stuff is now kind of out there in the Wikiverse. So, um, gods in the lake. Aboleths dwell in watery environments, including ocean abysses, deep lakes, and the elemental plane of water. In these domains and the lands that adjoin them, Aboleths are like gods, demanding worship and obedience from their subjects. When they consume other creatures, Aboleths add the knowledge and experiences of their prey to their eternal memories. Aboleths use their telepathic powers to read the minds of creatures and know their desires, and Aboleth uses this knowledge to gain a creature's loyalty promising to fulfill such wants in exchange for obedience. Within its lair, the Aboleth can further use its powers to override senses, granting creatures such as its followers the illusion of promised rewards. Hmm. I'm feeling the Aboleth on an almost Call of Cthulhu kind of level here, people. Ancient, intelligent, but otherworldly. Almost godlike yet monstrous. All right, let's look here towards the bottom of the uh, first column. Enemies of the gods, the Aboleths fall from power is written in stark clarity on their flawless memories for Aboleths never truly die. If an Aboleth's body is destroyed, its spirit returns to the elemental plane of water where a new body coalesces for it over days or months. Ultimately, Aboleths dream of overthrowing the gods and regaining control of the world. Aboleths have 
told, have untold eons to plot and to prepare their plans for perfect execution. Hmm. So, yeah. All right, now we get to the part on Lair. Um, and I, I, I think I've given a few ideas about how to do Lair, but um, let's take a look at how my initial ideas compare to some of the suggestions and some of the rules and mechanics that have been provided here in the Monster Manual. Abeleth's lair in subterranean lakes or the rocky depths of the ocean, often surrounded by the ruins of an ancient fallen Abeleth city. And Abeleth spends most of its existence underwater, surfacing occasionally to treat with visitors or deranged worshipers. Right there, gives you a great opportunity to create an Abeleth cult. Pick a, pick a creature. Pick, maybe, maybe it's multiple races that have formed this cult. It could be lizard men. It could be um, troglodytes. It, you know, it could be, um, I mean, there's so many aquatic or semi-aquatic or amphibian races that could have formed a cult to worship an Aboleth, um, which just creates a whole adventure thread to be integrated into your campaign. Lair actions. When fighting inside its lair, an Aboleth can invoke the ambient magic to take lair actions. On initiative count 20, the Aboleth takes a lair action to cause one of the following effects. The Aboleth casts Phantasmal Force, no components required, on any number of creatures it can see within 60 feet of it. While maintaining concentration on this effect, the Aboleth can't take other lair actions. If a target succeeds on the saving throw, or if the effect ends for it, the target is immune to the Aboleth's Phantasmal Force lair action for the next 24 hours, although such a creature can choose to be affected. Two, pools of water within 90 feet of the Aboleth surge outward in a grasping tide. Any creature on the ground within 20 feet of such a pool must make a DC 14 strength saving throw or be pulled up to 20 feet into the water and knocked prone. The Aboleth can't use this lair action again until it has used a different one. And number three, water in the Aboleth's lair magically becomes a conduit for the creature's rage. The Aboleth can target any number of creatures it can see in such water within 90 feet of it. A target must make a DC 14 wisdom save or take 2d6 psychic damage. The Aboleth can't use this lair action again until it has used a different one. Crazy. Okay, then the last chunk of this, I think is really more helpful in a narrative sense because it provides you as a DM with ideas for how to hint to your players that something's not quite right. Okay, so if we look down here, page 14, regional effects. So this, this section is great uh, help for a DM to use description to kind of hint to the party how something's not right and maybe hint to them what is the cause of that. The region containing an Aboleth's lair is warped by the creature's presence, which creates one or more of the following effects. Underground surfaces within one mile of the Aboleth's lair are slimy and wet and are difficult terrain. Water sources within one mile of the lair are supernaturally fouled. Enemies of the Aboleth that drink such water vomit within minutes. As an action, the Aboleth can create an illusory image of itself within one mile of the lair. Wow. The copy can appear at any location the Aboleth has seen before, or in any location a creature charmed by the Aboleth can currently see. Once created, the image lasts for as long as the Aboleth maintains concentration, as if concentrating on a spell. Although the image is intangible, it looks sounds, and can move like the Aboleth. The Aboleth can sense, speak, and use telepathy from the image's position as if present at that position. If the image takes any damage, it disappears. And then if the Aboleth dies, the first two effects fade over the course of 3d10 days. So the sliminess and the polluted water would fade. So, I mean, though, those just by themselves, I'm thinking back now. How do, you, how do you hint this, right? Maybe you, you know, your, your party's in this area and they hear about this region to the east 
that's had all these strange things happening. How, you know, there's a river that ran to a large lake and, you know, at one time the river became kind of polluted and slimy, but then it, it kind of, after a couple of weeks, it cleaned up, but now the lake is suffering from this thing. So, you know, they can almost like track and be detectives and kind of follow the clues, right? As they get gradually closer. But remember that the Aboleth's not a dummy too. Like it's moved to this region for a reason. It's establishing this layer for a reason. And maybe that reason is it has enslaved people to, to form a cult to it, who bring it sacrifices. Maybe it's looking for something. Maybe it's seeking something that is in this region and it needs minions to find it. Maybe it's some ancient magical thing that will help it rebuild its ruined Aboleth city. So there's so many potential story threads for this um, that I think are really awesome. But you know, just, just remember that any creature that you choose, um, always try to use it descriptively. Don't just name drop the creature for your party. Have it be a little more mysterious. Have them discover these kind of creatures to make it more interesting and more engaging. So thanks again for watching, guys, and we'll see you on the next one.